Well, I'm so honored to be here. This is a fantastic symposium. And to be on creativity and entrepreneurship is probably one of the most exciting things I can imagine. Uh, we've all been to a lot of symposiums and a lot of conferences, but when I saw the lineup of speakers on this, I can honestly say I've never been so excited to come to a conference. So I'm, I'm truly glad to be here. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, the creative architecture and entrepreneurship and uh, online education and royalty development. Uh, it's, it's going to be a way to talk about what we can do to support departments, to support faculty, to talk about early retirement and all those types of things, and we'll get into it right now. Let's see. This button? Which of these buttons goes forward? Nope. Okay. All right, creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship to develop on online courses is considered by many educational institutions as a global race to the top. Uh, we've all been experienced uh, this last past several years with what we have to do to create new online courses, to create uh, ways that students can access this information from their phones, from their iPads, and all these types of things. I'm sure everybody is engaged in some way in online. My clicker is not working. There we go. Over time, uh, fully functional and interactive online courses will be identified virally by consumers. They will grow and expand over the next, date and next decade and position themselves to be consumed by the masses. Online education isn't something that's happening just in the universities. It's actually being pioneered by the freelance entrepreneur. It's actually online education is in all facets of business and industry. Uh, we're seeing it in if, you're, if you even go to get a job at McDonald's, you're doing online training. If you're delivering fundamentals of any kind of uh, trade craft, you're doing online training. And nearly every business has some form of online training now that we're all using. So we're all pretty much engaged. Online training also extends to YouTube tutorial videos where you can learn any type of software. You can learn any type of uh, game or building TVs. If you want to take apart your computer, if I want to replace my hard drive right now on my computer, I can pull up a YouTube video and it'll teach me how to do that. All these things are ways that we engage in online training. <clears throat> you can learn how to dance. You can even learn how to sing and play musical instruments. Online training also extends to other things that we're doing in the online environment. For example, Dean Lucinda Lavelli, Lavelli, who is a very creative and entrepreneur dean, I am so happy and fortunate to be under her, she gave us a $3,000 technology grant. Now, $3,000 doesn't seem like a lot of money, uh, but actually in the online environment, you can do a lot of education with that. What we chose to do with that is we, had, we brought in 18 individuals from the industry. We're talking about to come into our jazz classes, we had Grammy winners that have won multiple Grammys. We had the heads of Disney Entertainment, the heads of Universal Entertainment, <clears throat> talent scouts from around the world, uh, some of the best big bands and, and jazz musicians uh, on the planet, all interacting with our class. Now, when you think about this and the impact of online education, you have to think about in the last 100 years or so of the University of Florida, Never in the history of the school with $3,000 were we able to connect our students entirely to the industry from East Coast to West Coast. And we did that with a small, small grant. So these types of things, I think, aren't being done so much in education as in terms of bringing the industry to us. We're trying to always connect to the industry, but really, these people will Skype into your classrooms for 125 bucks to 220 to 200 bucks for 20 minutes. And you spend 20 minutes of time uh, doing that. All right, so I'd like to talk about a couple things. One is this proven strategies uh, to create long-term uh, royalties and royalties for faculty. Uh, as we get into online stuff, uh, my financial models have to do with supporting departments over long term. Uh, they have to do with supporting faculty upon retirement. They have to do with alleviating in 10 years from now some of the financial struggles that we have in, in begging for money and uh, trying to get money because as money becomes scarce, it is a fight for it. 
Uh, partnering with publishing companies to build these robust platforms is one way to do it. This is something I'm not seeing, I haven't seen done very much in any of the models of online education. For example, uh, Canvas and Blackboard are pretty much sterile environments. Uh, they're not newly technology driven environments, even though they have their wonderful aspects to them. They're actually not catered to your specific textbook. They're not catered uh, to a lot of things that we have. And of course, there's one big, huge component, is these people want this information from their phone. They want this information from their iPad. They want the textbook information. They want the photos. They want everything that they're supposed to be responsible for on their, on their device. Now, when, when you don't partner with a publisher, it's impossible to deliver a superior online platform. I say it's impossible because you can't pull up the textbook. I believe that right now across the United States, there are probably many faculty <clears throat> that are walking the line on copyright infringements. They have in their PowerPoints materials from their textbooks. They have photos from their textbooks that they've pulled off online. We're actually endangering a lot of faculty in these ways. Of course, publishers probably aren't going to say anything because they're so excited that we're using their materials. But at the same time, it's not the most efficient way to deliver online training as educators. And by partnering with publishers, we can do a great deal. I've now partnered with publishers to do four online platforms, and uh, my platforms can deliver a very robust uh, picture of the course that people access on their phones. Mm -hmm. The all copyright access that publishers can give you, it includes textbook information, photos, flashcards, glossary terms, audio recordings, uh, access, of course, to PowerPoints and weekly outlines. Um, they can link directly in. Since the publishers are now taking on this expense, it's also something that the university does not have to engage in. For example, many of you are like, well, I want to build an online course, but I don't have eight months of my life to take out to actually dive in to build a course. The truth is, the publishing companies nowadays have contracted with the best online developers in the country. We're talking about moving that technology in such a way that it is being used globally by people that are delivering this uh, online technology. And publishers, what they can do for you is they'll take your information from your music history course, if it's from their, their, their textbook, and they'll say, we'll create all of your tests for you. They have a team of people that goes up there and does that for you, and your eight-month project now turns into a two or three days process once these type of contracts are in place. Now, when you think about that in terms of getting some of these classes up, as our educational model changes, as we see in Florida and stuff, there's a lot of really new things going on. Um, there's really some classes in the educational system that we also have to preserve. There's some that might go away. There's some that we have to consider, hey, we, we want to capture this information before it's too late. And these are times where we can partner for a small cost with publishers and have this information out there to be consumed globally. Now, also consider this, in partnering publishers to develop online platforms, it's a whole different model in terms of your course is available nationally. So a, a community college can pick up your course and, or pick up the course that's developed by the college, and they can, those credits that those students take transfer automatically into your school seamlessly. And there's this whole other aspect of how we, we make it nationally available. Likewise, if, you're, if the school decides we don't no longer, we don't need that course anymore, well, other consumers of that course that do still have that course are still consuming it, and they're always looking for a great online model. Publishers are willing to program the platforms as we talked about. They give tech support. I have tech support for four online classes. I have people with individual names that I call anytime I need aspects or help. I say, hey, this kid needs help. This one kid has a problem here. They're on it so quickly and, and eager to serve. This is what the publishers are doing lately. They have a high rate of student satisfaction. I have a very high rate of student satisfaction in our classes, not, not necessarily for any other reason, but the technology that they're able to get out of our class when they're like, uh, somebody from uh, the volleyball team is on uh, tour, and all of a sudden they're like, I have to study for my, my jazz history test. Well, they can actually pull up their phone and start reading the book. And I would say none of our classes within Canvas or Blackboard can offer that unless we've written the books ourselves. Uh, which is a whole different story, because we can partner with publishers and make that uh, much easier. Um, let's see. Finding the right book. 
there used to be the question, and there still is the question that's a little disturbing. Everybody is always saying, I need to find the right book now for this new course. And so this one doesn't have it. And of course, the university chimes in with new diversity issues that they want that are always pretty awesome. And you're like, yeah, I would actually. I want to include all that stuff in there as well. But you can't find the right book. Well, that is not the right question to ask anymore. Because when you partner with publishers, you don't have to use the whole book. You can say, I want to use chapters 1, 2, and 7. Make me a price on that. And I'm going to use your online platform to test on those platforms and also provide my testing platform. So we keep struggling over books and going, we see all the time faculty, I'm starting this new course and they're going through six or seven books, but they're asking the wrong question. Which book gets there just, just far enough where now I can pull on a whole board of people and I can say, I want you people to work on this aspect of this course and you people to work on this aspect. And guess what? All of the faculty can get royalties as well. They're eager to do that. While, getting while they're getting royalties, also the price of the book is dropping. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we talked about a little shortcomings here. As far as how do we create these contracts with the publishers? Well, most, pub most universities and colleges have a legal department uh, that handles these types of uh, intellectual property rights. I used our University of Florida lawyers. They put a team of three or four of them with me and uh, always met with me like every three weeks as we worked with some of the other publishers. And we partnered a class, uh, a jazz history course, uh, that was uh, very fantastic and, and had it a whole robust thing. It comes with glossary terms you can search in the book. Uh, we partnered with Rhapsody and reached out to Rhapsody because I told them, I don't want my kids paying for CDs. And they're like, well, they're going to have to pay for it. I said, nope, that's not the deal I'm striking with you. The deal I'm striking with you is figure this out for me or I have to go to another publisher. And so they came back to me and said, we made a deal with Rhapsody. All of your music for all of your listening is going to be made available on Rhapsody. And guess what? It's not going to cost you anything because it only cost us five bucks. Well, that course has over, last year served over 1,750 students, 800 in the fall and about 800 in the spring plus in the summertime. That course generated eight faculty adjunct positions for me where I didn't even have a jazz program. We, don't, we didn't have a jazz minor, we didn't have a, a jazz degree, and now I've got eight jazz graduate students. And we're talking about people, my drummer was in, the, in Modern Drummer last month, uh, Clyde Connor sitting in the back is one of the greatest big band drummers in the country today. Uh, and we, have, uh, we were able to attract great talent because we had this money coming in from online developed courses. Now the, the system's changing, but that doesn't mean this knowledge doesn't change. It doesn't mean we can use it to do other things uh, as we develop courses in the near future. When these contracts are in place, all parties get royalties. Let's say I have an $80 book from a publisher that's not selling. That $80 book from the publisher, I say to him, hey, I want you to offer this book for $60. I want you to offer the ebook for $40. And what I want you to do is I want you to take that other $20 and pay people to make this incredible. We're going to offer royalties to the university. We're going to offer royalties to every single author that comes on board. Uh, to give you an idea of what those royalties generated from one of our classes last year, it was nearly $20,000. And that $20,000 that came in filters down to my department. And if you have great deans and, and uh, chairmen like I do, they filter their money to me too and as well, and it's made me financially pretty much independent to do some things. Incentivizing, incentivizing teachers and exploring ideas. Universities really haven't found the right model to incentivize teachers to be able to go out there and create this stuff, to go out there and get this knowledge. They'll say, we want you to do this, we want you to do that. Uh, but there's not a real incentive. I'd like to just talk about, I don't know the answers to these things. I always look higher up for all those questions. I do my work and I know everybody else is gonna do theirs and that's kind of the way I play it. But I, I, did, I did think of one the other night and I was like, you know, this one thing would change the paradigm of what would make this different. For example, here's our royalty rights. And again, this may not be the answer, but I'm giving you an idea of an idea. Uh, it's 40% to the creator, 10% to the program, 7% to the department, 7% to the college. That's the old model you see at the top. <clears throat> that bottom model actually should say 20% of the creator's program. Uh, but let's say if we made a change that didn't affect the 35% that usually goes to the state and board of regents and all those things. What if we made the change where the, the developer got 45% of the model 
where 20% went to the creator's program. Now, in the old model up here, I would get 10% that came into my program, and then I'd have to go to my dean. Actually, I never had to go to my dean. I didn't even have to send an email. She always just sent me the money, which, by the way, thank you. Um, <laughs> My chairman was another story that took some work. You know, I had to always, he wanted to make sure I was always being financially responsible, so we always held that money a little bit to say, hey, what are you doing next? You know, we're not really sure what's, uh, but the bottom line is, if we filtered all that money directly to the department and we got rid of that little rule, then that would make people say, wait a minute, I can make my department financially viable. To give you an idea of what that did, uh, oh yeah, this may not be a solution, however, I am accurate in saying that creating solutions that target a financial incentive to innovate is how we're going to cultivate faculty entrepreneurs and attract top talent. <clears throat> so in dominating this landscape, these uh, byproducts of innovation have other uh, repercussions. For example, we have, those, we have those people that want to retire and they, they want to retire, but they're looking at the financial economy and they're going, I'm not sure I want to retire. I better stay in school another three or four more years and teach. Well, the one thing that we're not doing well in our departments is we're not creating products. We're not allowing these people to create products. If I start now, I have four on, on, uh, online courses. I've been teaching at the University of Florida for six years now. Hopefully by the time I'm retired at 30, maybe I'll have... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> One person got that. <laughs> no, but if I retire, I want to say I've got maybe two or three years of stability in that I can say this will allow me to retire two more years early because I now have two or three more courses that are bringing in $8,000 worth of royalties here. And of course, then the publishers want you to design things for them, and that gets into more money. The publishers are willing to put up the money. Uh, if, if you say, I want to film these videos of these teaching things and, and the department comes up with 3,000, uh, the publisher will come up with another 3,000. They, they, they want your business and they're going to do everything for it. They've expanded. I'm, uh, one of the things I'm most proud about with publishers is being able to survive in today's economy. So we have this byproduct of maybe even early retirement. This would save enormous problems and also allow these people to keep innovating for the college. We could even put an incentive where they were coming in with enough products and royalties that we could say, if you got this much, then we get to let you go. There's all kinds of ways you, that you can ne negotiate this product. But uh, from our royalties that we've been able to get through, the University of Florida that have filtered down from my chairman and my dean and, and, and to myself, we have, been, we have used that money to create a student-centered education. In other words, we, rate, we use that money to create dozens of student portfolio videos and showcase our students. We create promotional portfolios. We create websites. We uh, support guest light, uh, Skype lectures. For example, if I'm going to have a, a trumpet Skype lesson, I'm going to bring in Wayne Bergeron, who does all of the movies and plays on Gordon Goodwin. He's on 250 movie scores. You hear him every day and don't even know it. I'm going to bring in someone like him to talk to my trumpets as well because that creates the environmental demand that I need to really get into that student's cognition. I record student original compositions. We have more financial freedom without applying for grants, which is to a creative person is just the most horrible experience in the world because you want to get right to the work. And we can create CDs and do all those things. I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to add up uh, the last things here. Innovative ideas that we support are going to be happiness for the faculty where we can dis deliver a superior product. And that's really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we are the the prestigious educational university model, and we're not producing superior online products. But everybody else is online, even the freelance entrepreneur sitting there with just a camera. So we need to find a way of how to compete in this environment, what courses we can preserve with this type of things. And I honestly believe that now we need to throw more money at this than we ever have, because if you don't see it, we've got basically, companies are already doing this. I was going to show you a video today. There's no time of where we're already doing this. Um, but within 10 years, they're going to literally dominate the landscape. And you might not need us, uh, especially when Mikiki Okaku is speaking about mathematics and stuff, and he's got a perfect online video set. Are there any questions that people have about partnering with publishers or online training or any of that? Yes. Um, how are the graphics on the online uh, books or things that you're creating? Are they okay? 
The graphics are pristine because they're done by the publishers. They're brought in directly from the source textbook. Um, and they, it is in a, a sterile canvas environment. For example, you log in, it says week one, you click on week one, everything is linked directly to the assignments. Not only that, it's branded by the publisher. So you can see when you buy the book that it's exactly like the textbook. All of the links and everything look like the textbook. All of the listening looks like the textbook. And they also lay all that stuff out. For example, we have listening in each chapters of music history, and they laid all those out so students can just click on them and it takes them right to the Rhapsody account. So probably one of the strongest aspects is the graphics. Scott, I don't want to rain on your parade, and I certainly don't think this may be relevant to you, but... We talked uh, about it. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, for some disciplines, the knowledge in the discipline is changing so fast that wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't you know, you, you might not be able to retire on it because the field has changed by the time you get to, to retirement. That's true, but the semantics of information won't change. There's certain things we can't put in, as we discussed uh, last night, that you can't put in an online environment. For example, it's very hard to teach public speaking. But when you really get into it, you actually can do these things. Um, you, for example, jazz theory, the fundamentals of jazz theory doesn't change. It doesn't matter if it goes on and on. It just gets kind of improved upon. But actually, if, you, if you're looking at online models, and I had to teach public speaking, I could actually would do it by having several two-minute videos that people had to memorize and then submit. When people have to submit themselves doing something, they're gonna spend way more time on that than if they had sat there going, I need to prepare this for your class. So there's ways to actually, some people have said to me, well, you know, online training is, is blah, blah, blah. Well, we have two online jazz theory classes instead of four music theory classes, and they're both online, and our kids come out knowing way more, I'm happy to say it, they write amazing big band charts. I was gonna bring up a book by one of our jazz miners tonight that's this thick on jazz theory, because they can watch these videos over and over again, and basically you need to create the, the ability for them to teach in the online environment. Have we done? Thank you very much, appreciate the time.